Okay, so I had one last uh, rotated figure, and uh, I'm sharing the, the, the straight version with you. Uh, today we will discuss how we can uh, uh, claim a discovery. So this is an example which has been generated by uh, computer. And uh, uh, you see that, no, you don't see because this is switched off. Yes. You see here an histogram of data points. So you have a number of bins in a hypothetical mass of a particle you would like to uh, discover. And in every bin, you have the number of entries, uh, so the number of uh, data events which correspond to a given bin. So you have a little bit of excess in this area, and you would like to understand whether these excess, which I uh, model here in blue, could be the superposition of a background, which is a sort of exponential distribution. And on top of this, you put a Gaussian. It is pretty broad, so in this case, this excess would, uh, would fit well with the data. But at the same time, you may have other uh, reason why you have an excess here. In particular, imagine that you have some uh, fluctuation in the background, or maybe rather a fluctuation in the background, you may have also error in the prediction of the background. Here, I scale up and down the background by a 10%. So the, 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 the blue, the, the purple histogram is a background with, tep, with a, an extra 10%, and this one is a, a, less than, a decrease of 10%. So you see that these error bands, uh, in spite of the fact that they show here some uh, excess compared to the, to the prediction that you, you see here, they are also compatible with some uh, actually higher prediction of the background. So we would like to quantify this kind of effect. So one thing is to quantify the excess of a signal. Um, and this will be done with some uh, definition of p-value that I'm going to discuss next. And then the other thing is how to incorporate uh, systematic uncertainty on a number of uh, um, modeling parameters of your uh, probability distribution. This is one example. Here you have a systematic uncertainty on the uh, amount of background. But you may have also other things, like, for instance, how uh, large is the resolution of your peak? So is this the correct width, or maybe it is broader, or it is narrower, OK? So uh, in general, you may have extra parameters which model your PDF where you have uncertainty. And this, uh, this uncertainty may be uh, the systematic uncertainty you would like to include in your probability model. So we'll discuss these two things. Now I switch this off. And uh, uh, we move to the, to, to the, to the blackboard. So uh, let's consider one, uh, one, uh, one thing first. Let me get back to a, to a different file. Uh, my list of things. So uh, we saw yesterday that if, if we have a test statistic, some variable that tells us how how our data is uh, closer to signal compared to uh, uh, signal plus background hypothesis rather than the background only hypothesis, we can write a, a p-value. So imagine that you have a single value, a single uh, test statistic. We, call, we can call this t or usually lambda, OK? And uh, we expected the distribution for the background only hypothesis, something like this, and the, the distribution for the Signal plus background is this one, OK? Uh, we may decide that we compare the value which we have on data. So we have our, uh, our uh, data. And then um, imagine that we have a value of the test statistic that we observe in data, which is here, OK? He's, here is the value which co corresponds to our data sample. Now. Should we, uh, are we able, for instance, to reject the null hypothesis? Okay, so what should we do? This is similar to the goodness of fit discussion that we did before. So we compute now the area of this, uh, 
of this tail. This is very small here in this case. And we call this p-value. So this is a, this is, the p-value is equal to the probability that lambda from a different independent experiment, so if I rerun the experiment, is greater or equal to the lambda with, which I observed from data, okay? And this is exactly uh, what I did. Now, uh, the issue is that when we considered the chi-square, we knew uh, what, is, what was the chi-square distribution. In this case, uh, what is the distribution for the two hypotheses? Something that may be non-trivial, so we have to find it out. But anyway, in principle, this is what we need to do. Uh, as you know, instead of quoting the, um, the p-value, very often we convert this into what is called, uh, well, now the terminology is a bit different. So uh, in statistics, they prefer to use the term p-value and uh, what they call this score. In, uh, in physics, usually this p-value is just p-value. And here, this is often called significance level. While sometimes uh, in statistics, they call p-value, significance level, and so on. What is this, this score? So uh, imagine we want to translate the p-value into the area of the, an extreme tail of a Gaussian distribution. So we take a uh, Gaussian distribution with mu equal zero and with sigma equal to one, to one, okay? Uh, let's take a value z such that the area on the right tail is equal to p. So if we write in formula, we, we can write that the integral from z to plus infinity of a Gaussian distribution, so it's one over square root of two pi e to minus x squared divided by two dx, this is equal to p. And from this equation, you invert it and you obtain uh, z. So this is the cumulative distribution of the, um, of the, uh, the Gaussian, or more precisely, it is one minus the cumulative distribution. So if we define the cumulative distribution as phi of z equal the integral from minus infinity to z of the Gaussian distribution. Uh, we have that this formula can also be written as one minus phi of z equal to p, or if you wish, z is equal to what? So we have p, uh, uh, we have one minus p, and then we compute the inverse of phi. So we can, uh, we can, uh, blah, 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 blah. you can write it as phi minus one, one minus p. In practice, uh, there are a number of, um, there are a number of uh, library functions that allow you to compute this. Uh, this is also, this can also be defined in terms of error function. So <coughs> the inversion is usually uh, done numerically because you cannot really uh, solve this in, in a closed form. Mm, let me give you a couple of numbers. So if we have a p-value equal to, uh, let me check the number, one point three four nine times to minus, uh, minus, what, minus three, this corresponds to z equal to three. And this is called three sigma level. Uh, if we have p equal to to what else, uh, 2.85, 2.87, sorry, times 10 to minus seven, we have z equal five. And it's called five sigma level, level. These are conventional values, which are very frequently used in physics. So if we, uh, have a uh, p-value which is uh, um, equal to this uh, uh, order of 10 to minus three or less, we say that we have an observation, sorry, a, an evidence. 
while if we, have, if we reach this uh, five sigma level, we say we have an observation. So in, when you read the paper, evidence of something means that you, have, you reach the three sigma level. Observation means that you made a discovery, and here is the level where you, where you can claim that, you are, uh, let's say, uh, the community is, uh, is uh, sufficiently uh, convinced that this is a, a real effect. This P is not sufficient alone to claim the discovery, actually. And the reason is that there may be a number of effects uh, that have to be taken into account. And uh, in the next uh, uh, hour and a half, we will discuss what are the main effects that we need to take into account. So uh, don't forget that uh, this p-value tells you what is the probability that another independent experiment gives you the, p the, 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 the observed lambda star or higher. But this is not the probability that the uh, signal is present. So if we want to believe in the sense that the uh, that we are we trust that the, the hypothesis is true based on data, uh, we, we have to address this in a sort of Bayesian fashion. And so we need to have other elements which uh, reinforce the uh, uh, observation rule. But let's first understand the technicalities behind this uh, approach. And then we also criticize a number of points that uh, um, required a little more, a little more um, care. Now, uh, a simple example that we may want to use is the following. Imagine that in a very naive way, we want to uh, quantify our uh, peak just by counting. So imagine we have our data. And the simplest thing we can do, we, we take the distribution. Now, if we expect that there is a peak here, we can take a window in the, the reconstructed mass, and we just count how many entries we have uh, in the data. So if we expect a certain amount from the background, so this is the background level, is the area of this part. And then on top of this, we have some level of signal. OK? Uh, so uh, we can uh, consider what are the expectations now from theory, and then we can compare this with some data. So in data, we see that there is a given level here. So we measure actually n, number of counts, and we have to compare n with the prediction at least of the background. Uh, now, if we know the background and we can subtract it from n, we can say that the level of signal is just this part here. So we can say, basically, that the signal is equal to n minus the background. More precisely, this is an estimate of our uh, signal, signal, OK? Because we don't know exactly what the signal is. But we can estimate it, right? And uh, uh, if we are in a regime where we have a sufficiently large amount of data, we can suppose that this n, which follows a Poisson distribution, can be approximated to the Gaussian, OK? So Poisson distribution has an expected value which is uh, new, which is also the, uh, the, 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 the expected value of the Gaussian. And then you, the, the, this is the, the expectation value for n. And then you have also that the variance, or if you prefer, the, the standard deviation of n is equal to square root of uh, nu. OK, but nu is just a signal plus background. So uh, uh, nu is equal to the true signal plus background. And the variance is the true signal plus background. But you don't know the true signal. You know just the estimate. How can you exclude the background only hypothesis? The background only hypothesis, so H0, background only corresponds to s equals 0. Okay? And in that case, I expect nu equal b, and sigma nu is equal to square root of b. Okay? Uh, in this case, if I know 
Okay, let, I can just probably ca cancel this. So imagine I know the background without uncertainty, okay? So B is known with no uncertainty. In this case, what can I say? That the, 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 in the null hypothesis, the, uh, the, 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 the standard deviation of n is equal to square root of b. And uh, since I subtract a constant to n, the standard deviation of s hat is equal to the standard deviation of uh, n, because I just subtract the constant, and this is square root of uh, b. Now, if the distribution is Gaussian, how big is the area of the Gaussian, uh, and how can I translate into a, uh, into a significance level? Basically, I can say that the significance level, z, is equal to s hat over square root of b. Okay, because if I have a Gaussian distribution, the p-value is just exactly equal to the uh, area under the rightmost tail. Okay, so the rightmost tail is basically is this. So I'm here uh, in uh, I have s. Uh, sorry, uh, if I have uh, let's say a background b, okay, with the sigma which is square root of b, if I measure uh, n here, okay. I'm just saying that this is my estimate, s hat is n minus b, and uh, the p-value is just this one. Uh, so it's just, it's, uh, we, are, we have exactly this relation. Basically, when you have, when you have a Gaussian distribution, the uh, significance level is just how far is your observation from the expected value measured into number of standard deviation. So you just take s hat and divide by the standard deviation. Uh, in case you have some uncertainty on b, uh, the uncertainty on uh, n is equal to uh, the sum in quadrature of the uh, uncertainty on b plus the error and on the square root. So this could change in this case if you have uncertainty on s hat divided by the new, uh, the new standard deviation, which is the sum in quadrature of b, which is square root of b squared plus sigma b squared, okay? And that's all. So uh, I can measure the significance level of the excess. If this exceeds uh, three sigma, you have an evidence. Otherwise, uh, you can hope you have more than five sigma to have an observation. Uh, keep in your pocket this formula, which you can also uh, find on the PDG uh, particle data group review. If you are not in the Gaussian approximation, a better approximation can be uh, this one, which you may find sometimes in papers. So a square root of 2s plus b uh, logarithm of 1 plus s over b minus uh, s. And the reason for this uh, can only be understood in terms of uh, uh, um, approximation formula that I will discuss at the end of this lecture. So just keep it, keep an eye on this. There is a better approximation than just the Gaussian one if you have a low number of counts. So if you have low uh, values of S and B, and this is actually S hat to be more precise. Okay. But just if, if you see this, don't be, I mean, don't, don't be surprised because this is a better approximation than the Gaussian one. Okay, this is on one thing. Imagine that you have not observed a uh, p-value that allows you to claim a discovery. 
maybe you want to do the other way around. So you can go back here and you want to exclude, want to exclude that there is a signal. So what should we do? We should compute this p-value, okay? So the, the p-value corresponding to the signal plus background hypothesis. And I want to demonstrate that this is sufficiently small in such a way that I can exclude the signal plus background hypothesis. Um, in this case, most of the time we don't want to exclude a, uh, a new signal at the level which is as strong as we require for uh, discovery. For discovery, we require this three sigma level uh, or five sigma level. And for uh, excluding a, uh, an hypothetical sigma, usually the p-value is required to be less or equal uh, than 5%, or in some cases, even 10%, okay? In this case, we talk about exclusion at 95% uh, or in that case, 90% confidence level. Mm, this is equivalent to uh, take, you remember the name and construction, you remember uh, we take some observable that in our case could be the test statistic. We take a parameter that could be, I don't know, the signal yield for the new, uh, for the, for the new uh, physics signal. And in that case, instead of building, you remember the belt where you have the central value and the two extremes, what we can do, we can just take an interval that is not a central interval, but we move to an interval which is a, an extreme interval. So we include the rightmost tail instead of taking a central interval. And basically we get an interval which is fully asymmetric. So it's something like this. In such a way that when we observe some uh, value of lambda, our interval will be full, fully asymmetric. So we go from zero to uh, S up. In this case, we say this is the upper limit to the signal, for instance, or could be to a coupling constant, okay? So what, what, what we quote here, we say S less than S up, or usually at 90, 95% confidence level, okay? This is the way we quote the exclusion. Okay, say, say that, uh, uh, let's go to uh, a, another simple model. So we take again the, the case where we have a uh, Gaussian signal, okay? So, um, Imagine we subtract some uh, fixed background and we have some uncertainty that we can consider to be Gaussian. So in this case, what we have is the following. Here we have the uh, observed uh, signal, which is, uh, let's say, N minus B in that case, but uh, we can consider this uh, independent of this model. And if it is Gaussian, we can, uh, uh, consider how the true signal looks like. So in this case, this should be just on the diagonal, okay? With some uncertainty band that is, uh, I mean, um, you take the uncertainty here, and this is just, uh, sorry, I will draw this very badly. Is it, some, it is something like this, okay? So this is the uncertainty we get, and this is a uh, square root of, of B or whatever. Uh, uncertainty you want to put here, in that case, the uncertainty is uh, uh, bigger than square root of b, okay? Now, what is the problem here? Is that if you have an under fluctuation of the, uh, of the, of the background, because this may, may very easily under fluctuate, uh, your prediction could be negative. And if you are in a very extreme region, you may end up excluding negative signal region, which makes no sense. Now, there are a number of ways to fix this. And for instance, you can say uh, um, uh, that you 
your central value here is no longer uh, just the, 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 the S minus B, but if it becomes negative, I just quote zero, okay? In that case, how do you define the, uh, the, the, the uncertainty? Maybe we can just quote some, uh, answer, stop some uncertainty level here, okay? And then we quote for negative value, maybe the, 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 the the value that we found that we would have at zero, for instance, this would be a way to do this. Uh, uh, there is a, a way to do this in a, in a better fashion that has been proposed by uh, Feldman and Kausin, and it is rather complicated. I want to mention you quickly, but it is rather technical, and uh, this, this had some popularity for some time now. Uh, as a little bit become. Um, um, less uh, fashionable, how to say, because of the technical aspects it has. Uh, the, the idea is good, so it's, it's nice. So, uh, in general, what do we do? We, in order to construct the Neyman belt, okay, in general, you have some observation X and some theory parameter here. The way we do is so we fix theta equal to theta zero. And then we want to de define an interval and the center value for X. You remember, now the issue is how to uh, define the central value. If, you, if we use the standard Gaussian thing, we get two negative values. Uh, the, the, the choice that Feldman and Kaus proposed is to define the interval, which depends on theta, which is equal to the value of x, such that a likelihood ratio we call lambda, which is uh, the uh, likelihood of x given theta divided by theta zero in this case, okay? Divided by the likelihood of x for the uh, best fit value, okay? So, uh, why is this interesting? First of all, this is inspired by the, the Neyman Pearson uh, lemma, and this gives you the best separation between the actual. Uh, value you are considering here and the best fit value. And second thing, this is an interesting feature because if you take the example here and the best fit value is, for instance, uh, imagine that it is a diagonal line and zero for the, for the cases where you have a negative signal. Um, if you take the normal, the, the standard Gaussian uh, band, you have something here which ends up in, into the negative regime. If you uh, do the computation with the Feldman case, which unfortunately, even for this very simple case, requires numerical evaluation because the formula are not simple. Uh, so uh, I could write this for you, but it's, uh, these are just values of Gaussian PDF. So this is very simple. I mean, I could write this, but does not tell you more information because at some point, you have to invert this in order to have that the, the probability in this interval corresponds to 68% uh, or 90%. This is the, the serious issue. Uh, basically, what you have to do is the following. You have a Gaussian distribution. Then you have this likelihood ratio, which is, uh, so imagine that on one axis, I put the, the, the probability distribution of x, given some theta. And then here, I have a second axis where I put this lambda. Okay, this may be something like this. So what you need to do is the following. Take a horizontal line, cut lambda, and then measure the area under the PDF curve. So you have to repeat this operation, tuning the, 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 the position of this vertical cut until the area under the blue curve is uh, equal to 68% or 90%. So this is very cumbersome and uh, CPU intensive uh, process. And it's actually very slow to compute this interval. But the nice thing you, you have is that here you have an interval which resembles the, 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 the Gaussian one. Then this at some point gets slanted and with continuity becomes something like this. So you have uh, in some points, uh, uh, if, if you observe some value x, you have more or less a symmetric interval. If you move to values which are more extreme and that would run into these young physical limits, automatically you move into an asymmetric error band that then with continuity becomes 
a fully asymmetric band that gives an upper limit. So here you have symmetric intervals, it's almost symmetric intervals. Here you have fully asymmetric and you run into the upper limit regime. Okay. For this reason, this is called unified approach. Because the procedure to compute an uncertainty band or an upper limit get unified. Now, uh, so if you go into the literature or into library of common uh, program, you find this unified or uh, unified, or also the feldman in approach. Kausins. Mm. And now, but this contains some aspects which are not trivial. Let me go to, let me go to the prediction of the feldman kaussin uh, for, uh, for instance, for Poissonian count. If you go to uh, an ex a real example, not the Gaussian distribution, but the case of a Poissonian counting, for instance, you have this kind of a very complicated uh, ripple-like structure. You see, similar to what we encountered with the uh, Klopper and Pierce binomial interval. I'll, I don't go into the details here, and I don't ask you to uh, interpret this result because it, it is not very intuitive. Let's try to make another step and to go to the, uh, to the Bayesian approach. How would we get uh, a, a Poissonian counting with the Bayesian approach? And then maybe, since our brains tend to think in a Bayesian way, because we interpret this as you know, the p-value, instead of using the p-value, we would like to uh, measure the probability um, of the, the correct hypothesis. Let's try to see how an exclusion would work in the Bayesian way, and then we um, consider what happened with the frequentist approach. Let me also delete this mm, So what is the likelihood function for a Poissonian counting? So the likelihood function depends on uh, uh, the number of counts we have, and then depends on the signal and the background, and the background we may consider to be fixed with no uncertainty, okay? And this is just the Poisson distribution, which is S plus B to the power of N, E to minus S plus B, and at the denominator we have N factorial. Now, the posterior probability for S, given N, and we drop the background because we consider it to be a constant, is what is the, um, the likelihood function times the prior divided by the usual integral of uh, likelihood prior integrated over the S. Okay, what can we do to simplify this? As usual, we say the prior on the signal is constant, and this is an arbitrary choice, as I told you, but this makes computation easy. Uh, so uh, what is the p-value? The p-value uh, is equal to, is the probability to have a, a s above uh, our extreme value. So the p-value is the integral from the upper limit of s to infinity of p s Ds, okay? So I can write the, this in the following way. Maybe I write this in a new blackboard so you can read it better. So the p-value is the following. At the denominator, we have a constant. So we have integral from zero to plus infinity of the likelihood. And at the numerator, we can also put s here because p-value no longer depends on s, okay? And here we have an integral from the upper limit to infinity of L ds, okay? So in the ratio uh, n factorial simplifies, uh, you have to compute this ugly interval, but something nice uh, shows up because what you see here is that the p-value 
can be written as a, in the following form. This has been published in 1983 by, this, by Helene in this paper. And it is uh, uh, E to minus the upper value. And then there is uh, just an expression. I write for you, but it's not important. Infinity or, uh, yeah, no, N. Sorry, not infinity. And you have uh, S up plus B to the power of M, right? Divided by M factorial. And on the denominator, we have the same thing with S up uh, equal to zero. So sum from M equal zero to N, B to the power of M divided by M factorial. So whatever it is, you can plot it. And uh, something interesting is that for B equal zero, sorry, for, for N equal zero, which is a nice thing, this is a very easy expression because you get P value equal to E to minus the upper limit. And what you want, your actual upper limit is when the P value is equal to alpha, okay? So I get the, um, the, 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 the upper limit I want, which is basically reversing this thing, so I can write uh, S up equal minus logarithm of alpha, okay? And alpha uh, could be uh, 5% or 10%, and you get 2.303, for uh, alpha equal 5%, which means 95% confidence level. And you get 3 point something, 3 point, no, 2.96, sorry, is 3 basically. If alpha, I was wrong, sorry, this is 10%, and this is 90%, and this is alpha equal 5%. So basically, if you don't have any counts, so you don't observe any event. So you, you do a search and you find nothing. Uh, whatever is the background, because this is no longer depending on the background, because this is, simplifies, uh, you have that, you can say that there is an upper limit to the signal equal to 3 at 95% confidence level or 2.3 at 90% confidence level. And this is very simple. And this is basically this horizontal line that you don't see here. Here there is, uh, at 95%, there is 3. And here at 90%, there is 2.3. And if you include the background, you can compute this ratio. And you have these nice curves here. So you have two things. Uh, if you don't observe anything, your result does not depend on the expected background, which is a nice feature. Let's go back to uh, Feldman and Kausin. Uh, or maybe forward to uh, this one. Here, something which is really hard to understand, but this is a real frequent uh, um, result, is that if you expect n equals 0, uh, if you expect 0 background, you have this limit. If you expect more background, your limit gets worse. So if you design two experiments, uh, one which is uh, as a poor performance and expect more background. One which is designed uh, in a better way and expects uh, less background. Uh, if both experiments serve zero counts, the experiment that gives you a better limit is the one which is designed to have the worst background. This is really unpleasant to physicists, okay? <laughs> and this is an issue which has uh, come uh, in particular during the search for lab for Higgs, at, Higgs boson at LEP, and uh, um, has required a modification to the p-value that I will discuss you uh, before the break. And this is the famous uh, CLS modified frequentist approach. So uh, uh, I'll try to explain how this was uh, introduced. And uh, the, 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 the issue is this one. Imagine you have the, uh, you have your uh, test statistics, or better, minus two logarithm of the test statistic, okay? And this is the distribution, because this was a time of life, so year 2000, 23 years ago. Uh, so this is maybe the, 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 the expected uh, 
uh, test statistics for a signal, and this is for background. Here, they use the reverse convention that I use. So they put on the right the background uh, level, the background-like uh, distribution, and on the left, the signal-like. So it's, there is a just a minus sign, because at the time of life, they use the different test statistics. But this is just a, a sign of the times which passes by. And you can define two p-values, as we consider. One is pb, the, the p-value corresponding to the, to the background-like uh, distribution. And one is ps plus b, which is the signal-like distribution. And uh, let me see if I have uh, uh, what you can do. OK. What you can do is the following. You can, um, instead of quoting the p s plus b to exclude the signal, which is what we have done so far. So maybe let, let, let me try to write it, because in the, just looking at the picture is not clear. So you, do, you define a, a p-value for the uh, S plus B hypothesis, and you would like the p-value to be uh, before to be less or equal than a given confidence level, which is uh, sorry one minus the confidence level, which could be five percent or ten percent or whatever. Okay. Uh, instead of doing this requirement, which ends up in the uh, uh, and famous uh, feldman kaussin problem with the background, we sort of correct this, and we get rid of uh, this requirement. We define CLS, which is equal to the P S B, S plus B, divided by 1 minus PB. So this is uh, the way to cure this uh, effect. And uh, how you can implement this? A way uh, which was frequently done uh, at the time of lab, then, but then at the end of this lecture, I will uh, tell you about a method which uh, uh, allows to be faster, is to generate many pseudo experiments. So instead of having this true distribution, uh, you take your PDF model. Um, in the case we consider we have just Poisson distribution, but imagine that this test statistics may be more complicated as we will consider after the break. Uh, and here we uh, count, uh, the, uh, we, we measure, uh, estimate if you want, PS plus B as the number of toy experiments where uh, your test statistic is uh, on, the, on the right side of this tail and PB is on the left side. So actually uh, you can uh, define uh, CLS as the fraction, the ratio of the number of toy experiments where the test statistic is below the observed, uh, the observed value for the two, uh, uh, let's say, uh, test statistic, one for signal plus background, one for background. Why this cures this problem? Uh, if you have uh, very well separated distributions, you have basically that, uh, assuming that we, ha we have our test statistics in the bulk of the region where you expect this to be uh, in the signal plus background hypothesis, if they are very well separated and uh, what you observe is close to S plus B, you have that PB is basically zero. So if you put a denominator, the denominator is here, sorry, uh, one minus PB, it is one minus zero. And so we have, ah, no, no, this is also ugly. Sorry about that. Ah. Okay, so you, get, you have that this um, basically um, does not change the p-value if you have a good separation. If you have a bad separation, which is the case, for instance, if you have a large amount of background, okay, in this case, the two uh, distributions basically overlap. So pb grows, and at the denominator, you have a, a quantity which is significantly lower than one. So uh, you divide by a number which is uh, less than one, and PB increases, blows up. In this case, you can no longer exclude the, um, the, 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 the cases where you have uh, basically uh, a small PS plus B. So imagine you go on the right side just because of statistical fluctuations. So this gets small, but at the same time also one minus PB gets small. So in this case, you no longer exclude this region where you have poor sensitivity. So 
there are two things. One, this is conservative. Conservative because CLS is less or equal to S plus B. So your limit is less stringent in this way. And uh, prevents excluding cases with poor sensitivity. So if you think also what we discussed before here, when, you end, when we end up into negative uh, signal, okay, you are basically exploiting, you, we were basically exploiting um, um, under fluctuation of the background to make exclusion which are stronger than our sensitivity. We cannot exclude more than the physical uh, boundaries, okay? So this is exactly what we were doing before, and this is the way we prevent this. Now, you may ask, is this a valid approach from the statistical point of view? Uh, uh, I don't know, <laughs> because this is not a frequentist uh, upper limit. It, it is a conservative upper limit from the frequentist point of view. And uh, basically, uh, you are applying an ad hoc correction uh, to fix a, let's say, a counterintuitive effect of a poorly frequentist uh, upper limit. So these artifacts which you see here or in, uh, in the feldman causing uh, case, this one, are due to the fact that we are posing a question which is not we want to uh, ask to our data. So we want to ask to our data uh, what is really the probability that there is signal? But if we want to ask this question, we have to enter into this uh, Bayesian uh, uh, subjective uh, uh, regime that we would like to avoid. So if we want something which is objective, we have to pose a different question. So we put the question uh, about the p-value, which is not the probability that the, the hypothesis signal plus background is correct, but is the, is the probability that another random uh, example uh, example, uh, experiment gives us a test statistics which is uh, more extreme or at least as extreme as what we have. And if we pose this question, we have a number of issues that we have to sort of fix by it. Something which is interesting is that if we um, uh, compute the CLS limit for the case of, uh, uh, of the Poissonian counting, mm -hmm, the computation has been done, I will not do this for you, but you get exactly what Helen got for this, uh, for this uh, uh, binomial case. So the upper limit given with CRS uh, for this case are identical to the Bayesian one. Um, someone started to uh, claim, uh, okay, maybe uh, this is an indication that we can find some unification between Bayesian and frequency upper limit. This is not the case. So what we end up is, uh, with is that uh, in the regime where we have a large number of entries, so we uh, can, let's say, go to the, uh, I mean, we, we don't enter very small uh, fluctuation. In many cases, uh, the CLS limits are very similar numerically to the Bayesian limits. And in this very simple case, uh, they are really the identical even for small counts. But if you start to introduce other things like, uh, I don't know, systematic uncertainty and things like this, uh, you, you are not guaranteed at all that CLS limits uh, are identical to the Bayesian one. So uh, frequencies, even if they are correct in CL CLS, um, are limits that address a specific question, Bayesian address a different question. So there is no, uh, reason why we should be able to find a um, unified version of the two. Okay, maybe we can stop here and uh, uh, we uh, continue after five minutes break with the next topic, okay? Can you hear me now? Okay. Is it okay? Okay. So uh, yesterday we saw that on top of, the, of some background, you, you, we can put some peak. And we can model these with uh, uh, some parameters in, 
yesterday we saw that we can fit the signal, the background, but also these parameters that describe the, uh, the background PDF, lambda is the exponent of the, 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 the slope of the, uh, the, 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 the background term. And here we have the Gaussian, so we have a PDF proportional to e2 minus x minus mu squared divided by 2 sigma squared. So you can fit this, and uh, this shows you that there are two types of parameters. So if we want to, uh, I put, maybe I, I put this here. So if we want to quote a cross section, maybe we want to measure the cross section of a signal, okay? We are interested in this parameter, and we call actually this parameter of interest. Sometimes you, you read P O I, okay? And all the other parameters, are really required because they want the fit model to converge and to fit to the data, and they don't know exactly uh, from external source these values are. This is M not X. Uh, and these I usually are called nuisance parameters. And are, let's say, auxiliary parameters that I will not usually quote in the paper, maybe if I'm interested in uh, reporting the measured uh, resolution, maybe I will report sigma, but this is not the main, the main uh, result of my paper. And uh, these are also parameters that you may want to add to model systematic uncertainties, as we will see. Um, because maybe uh, how do you uh, introduce a constraint on external parameters which uh, reflects your uh, uns systematic uncertainty. Maybe you remember at the beginning of the lecture we saw these uh, plots, and now we can see it because figures are straight this time. Ah. You see here you have this background where you have an uncertainty of plus or minus 10%. So you can have a parameter that models the uncertainties. Maybe you see that background B is equal to an estimate of B plus or minus some sigma, okay? And this is basically a constraint, and this is the true parameter, which you don't know. So, so in general, we end up having uh, two set of parameters and we may uh, have different set of data to constrain these parameters. So imagine we have a likelihood uh, written in this form. So we have L of two samples, X and Y, and we have two sets of parameters, mu and theta. And imagine that these two uh, sets are independent. So we have likelihood of X, and X may depend on mu and theta. So the parameter of interest and the nuisance parameter, and the other set just depends on the nuisance parameter. So this may be helpful to constrain the value of theta, that otherwise I would not know. Uh, one example of this is what is in uh, this slide, and is an interesting technique that is uh, frequently used. This is, for instance, a measure, measurement of single top cross-section. Uh, so how do you uh, uh, identify uh, a signal which contains a single top production. So you count the number of jets in the event. Uh, so the single top is accompanied by a jet which is not, uh, well, maybe I should, should write a little bit of uh, physics here. So we have a top quark. The cork, top quark decays into a B, and maybe you have a W. And imagine that the W decays into a, I don't know, muon plus neutrino, okay? So we end up, you have a big work which produces a jet, a jet of uh, hadronic particles, and maybe this single top is produced together with another jet which is uh, uh, as a big jet. You may have a fair amount of uh, single top, which is the red uh, amount of uh, data. And here this is a variable, is how forward is this jet, which is also an indicator that is uh, uh, the top is produced in mainly in the forward direction. You see, in the forward direction, when eta is large, you have more single top than other backgrounds. But the other, the level of the other background is very high. So this is TT bar. 
how can you constrain the amount of TT bar? Either you trust the theory prediction, which has some uncertainties, and so your result is affected by this uncertainty, or you find a sample which is very similar to your one, but this is enriched in TT bar. So in, in this case, this sample uh, uh, is selected requiring uh, one extra uh, B-jet, and uh, uh, here there are two tags, so you, uh, you require one extra B-jet, and in this case, you have much less amount of single top, which still remains, but you have a huge amount of, uh, of TT bar. And if you fit together the two, you actually are able to constrain the, 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 the amount of single top. If you add a third category where you ask for uh, two jet, but none of, of them have the B tag, so this came come mainly from uh, w plus jets or other processes, and if you put the three together, you have the product of three Likert functions, and the three Likert functions, all fitted simultaneously, allow you to measure the cross section of the t single top process plus the yield of uh, t bar plus the yield of w. Do you care of these yields? Not too much because they are not sufficiently acu accurate to measure the t bar cross section. This is just the amount of t bar in that specific phase space which is close to the single top one you're interested. So these are nuisance parameters which you fix from external constraints. So you have some theory prediction, but you also have external data that you plug in here. Actually, this is a bit more complicated because in the second sample, you also depend slightly on mu. Mu is the, the, the cross-section for, uh, for a single top. So uh, in the ideal case, the external uh, sample only uh, helps you uh, constrain the, the, the nuisance parameter. But in this realistic case, there is a little bit of sensitivity also in CPLA, so it's a bit more complicated. Um, if you have instead just an external measurement, for instance, you have the background like this, what can you say? Well, I can say the following. Uh, maybe I have a likelihood function, which depends on uh, the, the number of uh, events I count, or maybe the number of entries in each bin, n1, and b. okay? I may have a complicated data sample. I may depend on the signal yield I want to measure, a number of parameters. <coughs> um, uh, b, I fit also from the data, but maybe I have a better constraint from external source, lambda, mu, and sigma. And what can I uh, write here? Here, I multiply by Gaussian PDF which has what? Uh, as B hat, the estimate as my uh, data sample, and depends on B and sigma B, okay? So this is fixed. This is my estimate of uncertainty. B is unknown, so I don't know what it is, but this is a common parameter which shows up here and here. I can do a fit simultaneously um, to the histograms and take into account that I can measure the background from the external source. Okay, this is another way to do this. And you can imagine to have a number of different uh, um, PDF that model, I don't know, jet energy scale, uh, the, I don't know, the theory uncertainties and so on. And this could be a model, for instance, I put a Gaussian. In some cases you see that if the, some parameter is bound to be positive, and this is the case here. Maybe the Gaussian is not the best, the best example because this may have negative tail. It, uh, negative background value is not very pleasant. So you may have something like a gamma distribution or a log normal. And uh, in software tools, you find alternative to model non-negative parameters. For instance, if you use tools like Rustats, The library provides you a number of options to model the external constraint in this way. How do you uh, deal with these nuisance parameters in the Bayesian uh, approach? Well, this is not an issue at all, because in the Bayesian approach, what you do is basically all parameters have uh, a probabilistic meaning, so you define the probability density for your parameter of interest mu and for the nuisance parameters theta, given the sample. And this is equal to the likelihood function 
of x given mu and theta, and this may be as complex as the one which you saw before. You put in the prior, which hopefully is uniform, otherwise you put Jeffrey's prior or what else, and then you normalize by in integrating everything. So, how do you uh, take away the nuisance parameters? You just do the integration. So, P mu is the marginal probability distribution. And it's just the integral over the nuisance parameters. And the denominator, I have the same thing integrated over both the parameter of interest and the nuisance parameters, okay? You see, this may be complicated, and usually it is done with the integration, and a technique which is frequently used is the Markov chain Monte Carlo. So we'll find a, a lot of uh, libraries using this Markov chain. I don't describe it here, but it, it is a powerful technique to do numerical integration by Monte Carlo. And how uh, we deal with this in uh, the uh, frequentist approach. So what was proposed at the time of LAP and was used also at Tevatron uh, before LHC was a so-called hybrid uh, um, Bayesian frequentist approach proposed by Cousins and Highlands. Uh, the approach consisted in uh, uh, having a likelihood hybrid that only depends on the parameter of interest and just integrate in a way the theta parameters. So what, what did they write? So x mu and theta. Sorry about that. Uh, does it work? Or maybe uh, uh, here you can also adapt the extra parameters here if you have this uh, extra term. So the, this likelihood function is the total likelihood which depends on the, on the nuisance parameter. Does it work? No. Uh, so uh, there is no guarantee to have a correct coverage. And, uh, um, but, but pragmatically, if one uses the CLS method, the limit uh, one gets here are close to the Bayesian limits. And uh, this is, uh, I mean, this is a, a something which makes uh, people comfortable, but not that much. I mean, this is not really what we would like to have. So what is the approach that is used nowadays with the LHC? Um, so you, you find a number of papers in, uh, from Tevatron and LAP which use this approach. And now, no longer, uh, basically no experiment is, is uh, using this anymore for a reason which I will try to explain you. So let's take a theorem. So we take advantage of a theorem which is uh, interesting and uh, gives us two kind of benefits. One, it allows to incorporate systematic uncertainties and the second one allows us to compute p-values in a way which is simpler than what I described to you before. To compute p-values, so far I told you, you have to generate many uh, toy experiments. Uh, there are uh, asymptotic formulae that allow to uh, avoid this, and I will try to explain you more or less how. Now, let's consider this theorem called Wilkes theorem. Wilkes, I think, is a, uh, yeah. And Wilkes theorem dates back to uh, the late 1930s. So it's an old theorem that got, I mean, physicists got familiar with this only recently. Uh, and this says this thing, that if we take uh, two hypotheses, which are written in terms of some parameters, okay? 
uh, how can we write hypotheses in terms of parameters? So this is done uh, in this way. So let's, let's open a little bit of digression. Maybe what is the uh, hypothesis that I only have background? versus signal plus background. So background only, signal plus background means I expect a number of entries equal S plus B. This means the same, but with S equal zero. So I can see that the hypothesis H0 is a special case of H1 with a constraint with one of the parameter. Uh, nowadays, rather than writing this way, uh, at the LHC, there is something interesting. Uh, <laughs> there is a new extra parameter which has been introduced, and we write n equal mu s plus b, where this time s is not the signal we want, but is the theory prediction. So uh, the null hypothesis is mu equal to 0, and uh, mu equal to 1 means standard model or whatever theory you take. If you measure, for instance, mu equal to, you not only have discovered the Higgs boson or whatever, but to discover that the, the, the cross-section is twice the standard model, which would, would have been an interesting result. Okay, so what you want to do, you want to measure that the, 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 um, that the, the, the yield you observe from data is consistent with the standard model. I open a parenthesis, this requires, of course, some uncertainty. So you need to take into account the uncertainty on the theory prediction, but this is a, an extra complication. So oh, let's, go, let's move back to this uh, Wilkes theorem and uh, consider that the hypothesis we are taking into account can be uh, written in terms of parameters. So imagine that we have an hypothesis H0 which can be written in this term. The parameter theta, which may be a vector of many parameters, is contained in, in a, a uh, set theta zero. This is supposed to be capital theta. And instead, the hypothesis H1 is that theta is contained in the set, which is uh, theta one, okay? Uh, if the two hypotheses are nested, so if theta zero, the set is contained into the set theta one, we say the, the hypotheses are nested. And if this is the case, we can build, thanks to this theorem, a te special test statistic, which is called the uh, chi-square lambda, uh, equal minus two logarithm of a likelihood ratio. And again, we, uh, we find the likelihood ratio. The likelihood ratio is uh, the, the uh, maximum uh, over all parameter theta contained into the set theta zero at the numerator. No, now it's important that we have the right uh, convention here, otherwise we have an opposite sign here, of the product, or, well, maybe you can just put the likelihood. The, the, it, it is the product if they are independent, likelihood of the data sample given the parameter theta, okay? So the data sample can also be a vector. And at the denominator, we put the, uh, the, 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 the maximum of the same quantity on the set theta one. If this is the case, uh, this likelihood ratio uh, is uh, also distributed according to a chi-square distribution with the number of degrees of freedom equal to the dimension of the first set minus the dimension of the second set, which is included in the other one, okay? So imagine that you have theta one of dimension one and theta zero of dimension zero, like this is the case. So I have just one variable here and a fixed point up there. In this case, this would be one degree of freedom. So I just have a chi-square. Um, so this time the notation is correct. So I used yesterday wrong notation. Uh, yesterday I made the maximum argument. This is really the maximum of the likelihood function. So the maximum of the likelihood function was what you get from the fit. So basically, uh, if I have uh, um, some nuisance parameters, so I'll move to this board. Uh, 
how can I build a test statistic where I can apply Wilk's theorem? What I can write is the following. I take as lambda, uh, and then I have to compute minus two logarithm of lambda, the likelihood ratio of what? So if I have just one single uh, parameter of interest, which is mu, uh, at the denominator it is very easy, because at the denominator I have to maximize the likelihood over all parameters. So the parameters are mu and theta, okay? Mu and uh, theta are the extra Nuisance parameters. At the denominator I put the likelihood function where I maximize mu and theta, okay? The hat means that, that I do the best fit. At the numerator, I fix mu to a given value, so this is lambda which depends on mu, and then I fit theta, so I put a double hat, in such a way that this, for a fixed value, is the set of nuisance parameters that maximize the likelihood. If this is the case, this is distributed as a k-square with one degree of freedom. Uh, so, if the distribution of this test statistic is, uh, so not this one, but uh, minus, two log minus two logarithm of lambda is distributed as a chi-square. So, if this is the case, I can do a fit here. I can scan the, 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 the plot and obtain the, 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 the same, basically, figure which I use in general for a uh, fit. And I obtain, at the same time, the estimate of the parameter and the, uh, um, the, uh, the, the test statistic I would like to consider. Uh, sorry, uh, it, is the, it, it is distributed uh, according to a chi-square if the hypothesis, um, the hypothesis theta zero is true. Okay, if, uh, so we need to make the hypothesis theta zero is true. Clearly we have to take one hypothesis, otherwise this doesn't make much sense. And how can we uh, proceed, basically? So we have minus two logarithm of lambda, and I'm sorry here, this is a plot taken from a tool called uh, Rustat, uh, it's a piece of the root libraries, and by default they plot minus logarithm, so there is a factor of two here that we have to take into account, but it's just a convention. So if I put the, if I scan this uh, guy, what I obtain is that at the minimum, uh, so when I have mu equal mu hat, so if this is mu, this is the fit value, uh, numerator and denominator cancel. So basically this is, a, a, at the top I've just scanned of the usual uh, likelihood, but I div divide by the, um, the, the, the maximum of the likelihood. So in this case, you know, remember the chi-square had a sort of distribution like this, where I have the minimum chi-square, here, my minimum is zero. And there are two effects. If you take uh, fixed values of the nuisance parameters, so you assume that there is no uncertainty, you get this curve. If you have, uh, if you add the uncertainty to the parameters, so if you place here a sigma, which is, uh, I mean, is 30%, uh, like in my case, you have two effects. One, the uh, the, the, the curve gets broader. So a broader curve compared to a narrower curve means that we have larger uncertainty. So if we want to measure uh, mu, a, a certain uncertainty, we have just to put a, um, a horizontal line at, instead of zero, plus one, okay, and possibly plus four if you want to sigma and so on, and then we measure the error. And then the error gets bigger. So you have immediately the uh, the effect of how the systematic uncertainty uh, increases the uncertainty on your measurement. And at the same time, for the hypothesis mu equals zero, here I have number of signal events in the old fashion, uh, I, have, I used this S instead of the more modern mu. I have that here, this is a value which I can uh, treat as a chi-square. So in this very specific case, let me see if I, I got, got the values. Yeah, in this specific case, this is, uh, uh, if you take this chi-square, okay, and you compute the, the p-value from the chi-square probability, this corresponds, for instance, to 3.6. So let's, let's take exactly the value. So I divide this by two. 
So this means z equal to uh, 3.6, okay, 3.66. And uh, here I divide this by two and I got 2.2 uh, uh, point what? No, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, this is, sorry, I, I should consider the, the chi-square probability, okay? So in the Gaussian approximation, the, um, the, 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 the chi-square is roughly uh, z squared, okay? So what you need to do is basically you take z approximately equal to square root of the chi-square. This is uh, a bit rough, but is uh, correct if, uh, if the p-value is not too small. So if you do this kind of trick, you can just take this and do the square root of this, this, this guy. So you, here you end up with the, um, uh, with the significance value, which is below three, and here you have uh, above three. So basically, if your significance is larger than three sigma, uh, if you don't take the uncertainty, add in the uncertainty, brings your significance below three sigma, and you can no longer write in your paper that we have a, uh, a, an evidence for new sigma, okay? So basically, when you compute the significance value, you have to be a little bit careful and put a plug in all the, the correct systematic uncertainty. So this also tells you why uh, in uh, physics, we are not usually very happy to quote uh, low uh, uh, significance values. Uh, there may be cases where we underestimate the systematic uncertainty. So if we claim a very high significance, this may also mean that we uh, have not evaluated correctly the systematic uncertainty. So setting threshold at five sigma, so require p-value less than order of 10 to minus seven, protects us against some level of uh, um, not correct estimate of the p-value, okay? There are other um, there are other issues. It is also possible, but this, this is a bit more technical, so I will just catch out uh, how this works uh, quickly. There are other ways to, de to, to um, define the uh, p-value in order to... Uh, so here, the p-value at mu equal zero allows us to exclude the null hypothesis. So works if you want to um, claim the discovery of a new signal. Imagine that you want instead to exclude some new signal. How do I proceed for exclusion? In that case, there is another uh, way to approximate this, uh, this likelihood test statistic. And there is another theorem due to another guy called Wald. Say something rather simple. So if you take minus two logarithm of this lambda, so this, uh, this uh, uh, test statistics, this can be written as mu minus the uh, fit value divided by sigma square mu square plus something which is of the order of one of square root of n. So this says basically that if you have a large number of measurement, you are guaranteed that the shape of this test statistic is parabolic. And if this is uh, parabolic, uh, you, can, uh, uh, you, you can basically uh, know completely the shape of this test statistic. And uh, um, if you take another assumption for mu, so if, if you, instead of assuming mu equal to zero, which means background only, you assume mu equal mu uh, star, a okay, specific value which you want to exclude, you want to exclude your signal. This is basically a chi-square, but uh, it's, it's a so-called non-central chi-square. So this is a chi-square where instead of having uh, uh, a, a, um, a Gaussian variable where you subtract the central value, so this is centered at zero, this is centered at a uh, displaced value. Again, 
there are, if you look into the literature, there are uh, known distribution of the non-central um, uh, chi-square. So it is possible, even if you take a different value mu, to know the distribution of this uh, non-central chi-square. I don't go into the detail, but there are libraries that allow to compute this. So basically, you can avoid running toy Monte Carlo, and you can uh, compute the asymptotic formula. Just the issue is where you take the estimate of this guy. Okay, and the way to do this is to replace into the likelihood a special data set. So the procedure which is found is the following one. So uh, the lambda depends on the data set. So you have two logarithm of uh, lambda which depend on your data set and on your parameters and so on, okay? So you can plug in a special data set called Asimov data set, where uh, the, uh, where the, uh, the value uh, which you get for the best limit is the, uh, is the true value, basically. So if you have that the, the, the fit value, mu hat, is equal to mu, to, uh, to mu prime, okay, what you end up in is, is something that uh, basically allows you to determine the, the, the value of sigma, because in that case, uh, you have minus two logarithm of lambda a, the, the, the the, 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 the test statistic evaluated on this special data set would be equal to mu minus mu prime divided by sigma square hat. And then you can determine sigma square hat equal to mu minus mu prime divided by minus two logarithm lambda, lambda a. So how do you get a sample where you determine the, uh, you have the true value. Well, if you just have a Poissonian counting, for instance, you have this e to minus s plus b, uh, s plus b to the power of n, and blah, blah, you obtain the true value. Uh, if you just plug in the, uh, instead of, of having n, which is what you observed, you can plug in n equal s prime. In that, ca in that case, even if it is not an integer, Okay, it's not, it's not necessarily internet. In that case, the estimate s hat turns out exactly equal to s prime. So usually what you do is the following. Imagine you have a fit of a number of histograms. So you take the histogram value, which you have from uh, uh, theory. So for instance, this is the background. Well, maybe let me put some colors here. Here you have the signal. And what you do, instead of putting the number of counts you have from experiment, you put the theory prediction for each bin. Okay, theory prediction given by signal plus background. Uh, I don't go into the details, but basically when you hear about ASIMOF dataset, This means that there is a prescription to uh, approximate the test statistic uh, in such a way that then you are able to compute the p-value without doing, running to Monte Carlo. And this gives you a formula which are valid in the asymptotic limit of large number of entries. The reason why uh, this is called Asimov data set is because uh, there, there is, was a, novel, a science fiction novel by Asimov where instead of democracy, basically, a single individual would speak in such a way that he represented all the population. And this is basically this representative uh, data set. You will usually never uh, write this on your own. You will run libraries, typically, again, Rustats. When you will see Asimov approximation, when you read Asimov approximation, now you know more or less what it means. So it's a way to determine asymptotic formula, which can be useful for, uh, for, your, uh, um, for your analysis. And one of the reasons why we need this kind of complex thing is that 
we just don't use this uh, test statistic. There is an extra complication, which I just mentioned, but uh, again, you can refer to uh, literature. I just want to give you a, the complete picture, and then if, if you need more details, you can get there. Imagine you want to put, uh, to set an upper limit, okay? Uh, then uh, you measure your signal, mu, okay? and you have an estimate mu hat, you, you can have two cases. One is mu hat is greater or equal than zero. And in some cases, you may have under fluctuation and you have negative uh, mu. In this case, do you want to use negative mu to set an upper limit? Possibly not. And there are uh, a number of paper where instead of using uh, uh, lambda, evaluated at mu equals zero to set the upper limit and to define the, uh, the, the p-value. More often, there is, you find this definition, you find minus two logarithm of lambda set for mu equals zero uh, if we have positive uh, mu hat. Otherwise, you set the, the, the estimator at zero. In this way, You don't spoil your upper limit in case you get negative p-value. Now, do you remember the first lecture when I gave you a PDF and I say, uh, uh, if x is small than 0.5, I, I, you remember we, have, we had this pathological PDF where we had this uh, spike at zero. I, I said, if I have a uniform distribution from zero to one, you remember? And then I have, uh, instead of x, I can have the distribution of uh, max 0.5x, you remember? Here, we never have less than 0.5. So this is an area of 50% probability. And we have, with 50% probability, a single value, which is 0.5. You remember there was this delta Dirac at the beginning? You, I show this just because in this case you have exactly this. There is a fraction of cases where you have this Q0 equal to zero, and another fraction of cases where you have this guy. And again, with this ASIM of data set, you are able to, um, to uh, uh, predict the distribution, which has a delta Dirac component. So there are a number of technicalities, which is very complex, but basically now you have more or less all the ingredients to master that. And there is an even more complicated test statistics used for the Higgs boson that protects you both in this case and in the, ca in the case also in, in which you have a mu hat greater than the hypothesis you want to test. But I don't uh, enter into this discussion because it is quite complicated and more advanced that I would like to show you. So how do you uh, end up at the end of the, of the game? You end up with something like this. This is a more or less realistic uh, uh, Higgs boson uh, plot, which I taken from CMS. So you take a distribution for uh, the background here, the, the, the blue and the green are two components for the background. Here is, you have a distribution for the signal. And then you fit a probability model, which contains the background with some uncertainty, so some systematic uncertainties, the signal with some uh, theory prediction and some systematic uncertainties related to the, the width and so on. And then what you can do, you can scan the, um, the, 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 the p-value obtained by fixing the Higgs boson at a certain mass. And what you have, you have this local p-value, which at some point gets very low. So in this case, if you assume a Higgs boson mass which is close to this peak, the uh, null hypothesis that there is no signal becomes uh, very inconsistent with the presence of the presence of this xx, which you can quantify. And since, since this gets down to uh, uh, a level which is of the order of 10 to minus 7 or less, then this gives you, allows, you, allows you to claim a five sigma discovery. On the other hand, you can try to set a, a, an upper limit exclusion on mu, which is a sigma divided by the standard model cross-section. And you see that assuming a different value, the Higgs boson mass, you end up excluding a value of the, uh, the, 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 the signal strength, so the, the cross-section you measure divided by the, the standard model, which is 
below the line one, so you basically below one means you significantly exclude the standard model, uh, up to a certain mass, so for a very high mass, the experiment is no longer sensitive. And for, in particular, a mass range which is close to the peak, you end up, you are no longer able to exclude. So you are not able to exclude, and you are able to claim the observation. Um, you may want to compare this to the prediction in case of simulation where you expect the standard, uh, where you don't, uh, don't put in the simulation the standard model X boson, you put just the background, and you see that you expect this uh, blue curve, but you may have fluctuations. So you can plug in the one and two sigma uh, fluctuation band, which by the way can be also computed with this asymptotic formula here with the asymptote data set. So you don't need to uh, generate for each point uh, thousands of toy Monte Carlo in order to make this distribution. And you can compare the limit you get to the expectation. So you see that the limit is uh, definitely worse here because there is an excess that you cannot, does not allow in data to exclude the exposure. Now, the last thing which I would like to discuss in, the, in this final part of the, of the lecture is uh, this issue here. Uh, so, uh, this is not the end of, of the story, because what you are claiming here with this kind of plot, for instance, this is Atlas instead of CMS, but it's a different paper, but it's exactly the same story. Here, notice that we write here a local p value. So, uh, what is the, um, the difference between claiming that for this particular X boson mass, I can claim discovery, and the uh, claim that I want to make in general, I discovered a Higgs boson in this range, okay? Now, you may have fluctuation in different uh, regions of the, of, the, um, of the mass spectrum. So here is a, what is it? Here is the plot by CMS. So maybe uh, also this could have been a Higgs boson, okay? And, uh, this may be due to some fluctuation in this area. So what you measure here is the probability to have a fluctuation in the uh, region where you are sensitive to. But you have a fluctuation in another area, you may also claim the presence of X boson in another area. So the probability to have a fluctuation here may be very small, but the probability to have a fluctuation here or here or here or here, blah, 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 blah in any point may be significantly uh, lower because the probability that something happens uh, in, if you give more alternative alternatives, the probability gets higher. So how do you, um, how do you uh, take into account the fact that, uh, that, the, um, that the, uh, the, the spectrum uh, can exhibit a probability at any value? But, the, the simplest thing to do is brute force. So you take, this is just a toy experiment, you take uh, many uh, simulation with background only, okay? And you generate many, many experiments. And then you count how many times, just by random fluctuation, some excess localized in a very specific point gives you the, uh, an excess. So if you just fix the mass value, you obtain basically the local uh, p-value. If you, oh, if you uh, are, uh, claim a discovery if there is a, uh, an, uh, an excess exceeding the phi sigma level in any uh, place of the spectrum, you measure what is called the global p-value. So if you want to test against a, a p-value of the order of 10 to minus 7, you have to generate uh, tens or hundreds of millions of toy experiment, which can be very CPU intensive. And this is uh, the way that actually this was done uh, for a long time, until the, uh, we had a nice paper by, um, by Elam Gross and collaborators, and they basically uh, made the following observation. There is no test statistic that allows you to build any likelihood ratio like this one. So basically here we don't enter a regime where we can apply Wilkes theorem, but there, are, there is a, 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 a theory coming from uh, random fields that again allows to uh, make an extrapolation 
of the p-value which you would measure if you instead of uh, requesting 10 to minus 7, you request, for instance, 10 to minus 2. And this is manageable with Toy Monte Carlo, okay? Uh, there is a scaling law, which is a sort of exponential uh, uh, under some uh, um, parameters, which allows you to run the Toy Monte Carlo in a simplified case and extrapolate this to the, the case of very low uh, probability. And in particular, I, I write you the formula, but I suggest you to go to the paper by uh, Elam Gross because the, 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 the issue is not, uh, let's say, uh, straightforward and actually requires uh, some results from theory of uh, random fields. And basically, the, the, global, the global probability, the p-value uh, uh, measured on the global uh, interval, um, can be estimated as the number nu, and I define what is nu, uh, plus a term which is uh, a, a, a k-square probability, okay? What is u? u is the level where you want to determine the p-value. So u is, is uh, either 10 to minus 7 or something else. And what is interesting is that you can scale nu, this estimator, and I will describe what it is, from a value nu0, where this is more manageable, with an exponential term, which is e to the minus u minus u0, divided by 2, I think. So the, what is NU? NU is, uh, is uh, the number of up crossing, uh, technically. So you take the test statistic, uh, Q, uh, which could be uh, this modified test statistic or lambda minus two logarithm lambda, okay? And uh, this is usually low. Then if this jumps up because of some excess in the data, this gets very high. So you want to compute, given a given level U, how many times this crosses this uh, alert curve with positive derivative. So if this goes up and down, you just count once. So you count one, two, and three. So in this case, you, uh, the number of up crossing is two. Now, it's not sufficient to get just a single Monte Carlo. You run many Monte Carlo, and you have the average number for a given level. Now, if you uh, just stop here, you put u to 10 to minus seven, minus seven, and uh, uh, you have to run many, many toy Monte Carlos. Uh, if instead you use uh, uh, an, a level which is more manageable, when on average you get, uh, I don't know, uh, a few of these counts, you can run the Monte Carlo, make the estimate at this level, and you scale it uh, uh, in this way, so your Monte Carlo is much more efficient. Uh, actually, uh, I could try to sketch you how this is done on this very specific case, because Elam Gross likes to show this, on, instead of running on Monte Carlo, just running on a single experiment, which is uh, Atlas, is from Atlas. So this is the p-value of uh, the actual test statistic used by uh, Atlas to uh, exclude the, 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 the Higgs boson. So the actual p-value, you should not look at p, but if you want to something that can be compared to a chi-square, you should look at how p translates into the number of sigma. So if you take zero sigma, which is p-value of 0 0.5, so zero sigma is, you count the number of up crossing, which is one, two, three, four, five, I think it's nine here. And uh, basically you can estimate the number of up crossing just from a single count to be nine plus or minus square root of nine, which is three. And then extrapolating this from the level of, uh, um, of 0 0.5 to uh, five sigma, so basically, you have the, the number of, this is at, at uh, 0 0.5, the number of up crossing at 5 sigma becomes uh, this 9 plus or minus 3 times e to what? 5 sigma squared minus 0 sigma squared. And so you get basically a correction factor of the order of uh, uh, 10 to 5, okay? So basically, you end up uh, from uh, a, a local p-value of 3 times 10 to minus 7, you get down to, what, it, what is it? 3 times to minus 5. And so instead of uh, having uh, four, 5 sigma, you have a global p-value, which is uh, 4 sigma. So instead of 5 sigma, you have 4 sigma, okay? 
So now, uh, what is the exact threshold that we should ask for? Should we ask for a local five sigma threshold, a global five sigma threshold? This is a matter of convention. So usually paper are uh, quote uh, reasonable result when the local sigma is pretty high. But beware that in multiple dimensions, uh, this um, Lucas or effect may even be more uh, pronounced. So if you measure at the same time the mass and width of a resonance, the uh, Lucas or effect, this is called Lucas or effect, I forgot to mention. Lucas or effect. Also called LEE. So in multiple dimensions, this may be more severe. And there are other ways to estimate these with a slightly more complex uh, tools. OK, I think I gave you an overview of the main tools which are useful in uh, high energy physics and particle physics in general. Uh, I didn't give you too many details because many of the uh, technicality depend really on whether you are interested or not in a very specific topic. So I hope uh, you had a rather complete, even if somewhat shallow, overview of the tools which are available on the market. Then uh, go to the literature to focus more on a specific subject. Okay. So I'll possibly I leave the last five minutes for questions if you have. Forgot to mention, most of what I showed today are things that you will never have to write your, uh, yourself. You just get some library which implements this. I mean, unless you have very simple cases. No, but me vado Devo partire. Yeah, because I have to leave uh, this uh, right after lunch. Um, I don't think it's working. Or it's, uh. Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, so with the Feldman uh, Cousins method, after we've calculated the ratio between maximizing the likelihood function for a given Sorry, uh, you mean the, 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 the ratio of the, profi the, of the profile like you estimate or the one where I, I, I didn't get exactly your, your, yeah. your question. Yeah. Ah, in the unified approach. Yeah, the unified approach works this way. So basically, so, you want to construct a Neyman belt. So what we have to do for a given observed value, could be the number of counts in the case of Poisson and so on, and for a, uh, and for a given uh, value of theta, you want to know whether you are inside or outside this belt, okay? And this is done by fixing a value theta zero and computing this interval here. Now, how does it work in the case of uh, Feldman Kausin. So we take the distribution of the of the variable x for a, for a given x zero, and this is something that we know. Hmm? So we have uh, the probability distribution of x given x zero, given theta zero, theta equal to theta zero. Then we have to decide which is the interval. So we could take at 68% this interval or another interval and so on. So the criterion we uh, choose to define this interval is to construct, maybe I put on a different plot, the likelihood ratio 
of the um, uh, hypothesis uh, which I'm considering, theta zero, divided by the hypothesis theta hat, which is the one of the best fit. So I have a different curve here. So this likelihood ratio may be something like this, okay? And I want to put a cut so, so that this lambda must be greater or equal to some uh, threshold value. Now, if I set the threshold value here, okay, I have this interval, which I can project above. And this turns out, turns out to correspond to this interval here. So I measure probability, how much is this? Bo, 80%. So I don't like this 80%, so I move this a little bit down. Okay. Oh, sorry, I move this a little bit up. So now I have this interval. Okay. How much is this? Maybe this is uh, 60%. So I've, in, its, in order to have 68, I need something intermediate. So imagine I proceed dichotomically, and maybe if I have this value here, I get an interval, which is finally 68%. So when I'm done with this uh, numerical procedure, I'm happy, and I freeze this histogram, this interval. So this interval here is what I report here. Okay, and they do this many times. So you, you understand this is a very slow procedure. So for every, every theta, I have to define this interval together with the best fit value, which is at the center, okay. And eventually I will get the uh, curve which I told you before, then for, uh, for unphysical value, does not go to negative values. So even for the Gaussian case, I can write the likelihood ratio because it can be written in terms of exponential, but then, uh, inverting this equation is not, is not straightforward, you see. And basically there is no case where you don't need a computer to do the computation. So every even very basic application of this method requires uh, so the, this procedure which has to be repeated for every value of the parameter. And for multiple dimensions, imagine that this is much more complex because for every cut like this, the interval is a, a multidimensional contour. So this is not practical for modern one dimension and is implemented in a number of cases, but is nowadays no longer very much used. I mean, unless there are very specific reasons. Uh, in some neutrino experiment, I think it is, uh, has been used uh, with, uh, I mean, uh, pretty heavily, but mm, is not really a widely used method. But this solves some of these uh, uh, technical aspects related to unphysical values, which are prevented in this way. But I mean, yeah, you, you can uh, send me emails offline. I can send you references if you are interested in uh, having a deeper uh, insight about topics which I cover. Okay, <laughs> the